Continuing on with our lecture on sensors in biomedical devices, so we will talk now about chemical sensors. In particular example here is the glucose monitor or the glucose sensor. So the glucose sensor operates by uh, a redox reaction between an enzyme and your glucose. So briefly, the, the reaction goes like this. So you have your glucose. Uh, of course, it's measuring glucose. So you have your substrate, which is glucose. So glucose is oxidized by an enzyme. So the enzyme can be glucose, uh, or rather for oxidation, it's glucose dehydro glucose oxidase. And then there's also another uh, another system, which is actually very similar, but instead of um, oxidizing the glucose, it, this one reduces glucose. That was glucose dehydrogenase. But regardless, the, the mode of action is uh, similar, so it involves a redox reaction. So if you remember a redox reaction from your general chemistry lectures, so in a redox reaction, you have here a transfer of electron. So the, the reactor, or rather the, the species that loses electron uh, becomes oxidized. So when you are oxidized, you lose an electron, and when you are reduced, you gain the electron. So for the reaction, uh, this one is the reaction for uh, glucose oxidase. So in glucose oxidase, uh, the, the enzyme, glucose oxidase, is uh, rather oxidized as glucose. It becomes gluconic acid. So when glucose is oxidized, uh, as it undergoes oxidation, it loses electron. So the electron is transferred to the enzyme, or rather in particular it's actually FADH, uh, the um the electron carrier portion in the enzyme but anyway so the enzyme now becomes reduced so the the enzyme will then transfer it to a uh, mediator so the mediator uh in most system that's actually fadh uh flavin adenine dinucleotide so you have your uh, enzyme uh, it, it passes the electron to your uh, mediator and the mediator passes it into your sensor. So it's an amperometric sensor and then the, the passage of or when the uh, mediator passes the electron from that was originally from glucose to the sensor, it generates a current and that's actually how it senses your uh, glucose, the presence of glucose in your glucose monitor. So it's, it just uh, follows the flow of electrons. So the electrons are just passed from the uh, substrate, which is glucose, to the enzyme, then enzyme to the mediator, mediator to the sensor. So that's basically your chemical sensor. So we have two types of sensing systems uh, available in the market. So you have the uh, the one that is usually seen, uh, especially here in the Philippines, is the one that uses uh, glucose oxidase. And we also have uh, another system, which is glucose dehydrogenase. So the difference between the two, uh, actually this, we will look at the difference, but um, the one of the main difference, of course, the use of the, the specific enzyme involved. So for glucose oxidase system, it uses the enzyme glucose oxidase. For the glucose dehydrogenase system, it uses the glucose dehydrogenase enzyme. So let's look at GOX or glucose oxidase uh, GOX sensor. So GOX or glucose oxidase. Uh, glucose oxidase sensors uh, have uh, high specificity with uh, glucose. So the uh, if you compare between GOX and GDH, so GOX or the glucose oxidase sensors are more specific with glucose in particular compared to GDH. However, uh, the, the readings become sensitive when you have uh, high oxygen concentration. So the glucose oxidase, although it's very specific, it only uh, detects sugar in the blood or rather the, a specific type of sugar which is glucose. Uh, it, these, the reading can be uh, affected by the level of oxygen so spo2 uh, from the previous lecture you have spo2 which is the level uh, the, the, the the amount of oxygen in carried by the hemoglobin in the blood so at low spo2 levels the blood glucose level is overestimated because somehow oxygen affects the the performance of the glucose oxidase and um, the other system is GDH, glucose 1 dehydrogenase. So this is the enzyme involved. So uh, the difference is that uh, GOX, uh, there are differences in the enzyme. So GDH is the enzyme. 
So, although they are more uh, resistant to glucose, so they are not affected by glucose concentration at all, but the problem with glucose dehydrogenase is they are not so specific with glucose. So, in your blood, uh, just a brief background, in your blood, uh, glucose is not the only sugar in the blood. So, you also have maltose, you also have lactose in the blood. So, um, in the GDH, they are not very specific to glucose. So, they can also react with maltose. So, uh, for example, if in the blood, you only wanted to know glucose levels, but since it also reacts with maltose, if you have high maltose concentration, the GDH uh, sensing system will also detect the maltose and it will read as glucose as well. So, it, it also tends to overestimate blood glucose level if you have other sugars in the blood. So, uh, as you can see, uh, from what I can see here in the Philippines, the most common is the GOX sensor because uh, it's more very sensitive to oxygen. So, you just need to look at SpO2. So, the, the usual practice is measure SpO2 levels first and then do the uh, glucose oxidase mon uh, the glucose monitoring using the GOX sensor. So, if you have a low SpO2, do not, uh, it's, um, it's not advisable to actually measure with the GOX sensor. So, uh, because di actually, the reason why we have glucose sensor is because of the prevalence of diabetes uh, in, uh, in the population. So, uh, and also we have here, because this is a type of, um, it's a type of a disorder that people have to live with. Uh, we have many uh, glucose sensors in the market and that is why we have these guidelines, ISO 15197 guidelines for portable glucose monitors. So, uh, the requirements for a portable glucose monitor, if you wanted to design a blood glucose monitor, is you must have a high specificity to the glucose concentration only. So, again, uh, do not, it must not have cross-reactions with other blood sugars or even non-sugars. Uh, non uh, sometimes, there was there are cases where it reacts to amphetamines. Uh, sorry, it's salicylic acid, uh, aspirins. Aspirins and some uh, maintenance drugs. So, they can affect uh, the specificity. So, the a good um, monitor must have a good a high specificity. It must only detect glucose. So, the blood glucose meters must provide results that are within 20% of the laboratory standard 95% of the time. So, that means the accuracy and uh, precision. Here is actually precision. It must be accurate within 20%. 95%, it must be both accurate and precise. And this is the exact values. So, ac accurate within 20% and precise 95% of the time. And then the third one, it must have a high degree of linearity over a wide range of glucose values because the measurement usually uh, is made uh, through calibration, fitting it over a curve. So you must have a good linearity to have a proper uh, reading or a proper measurement or calculation of the uh, measurement signal versus the calibrated measurement. Uh, next is the device must uh, needs to be small, portable, and robust given that the patient may have to take readings in a number of different environments, both inside and outside the home. And uh, the required blood volume should be less than 1 microliter and the needle very thin because, again, this is a blood glucose monitor. You need to shed blood for this. So if every time your monitor requires more than one micro, more than a drop, Basically, say 1 ml of blood. And the usual practice for diabetics is they need to monitor blood glucose 2 to 3 times a day, at least uh, at, at least once every day. So, if you are shedding blood 1 ml every single time, they will become anemic. So, they must have very small blood volume. And of course, the needle must be very thin because of course, you need to prick yourself every time. And the analysis time should be very short to allow a quick response in case of either hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. So the reading must be fast. And of course, uh, the cost should be less than a certain measurement. Actually, in the Philippines, we have the glucose strips. Uh, the, the strips itself uh, can be uh, bought from Mercury Drug or the local pharmacy. Uh, they, uh, I think, uh, because we have been using that uh, during my time as an MS student, we were uh, actually uh, not for medical purposes actually we were doing research with uh, mice we induced diabetes in mice and then measuring their blood uh, blood glucose levels so we were buying uh, glucose strips so the sensing because uh, the the strips uh, the, the sensors itself are uh, 
disposable. So, one-time use only. So, it must be a less cost because, again, if you consider the, the usage of this one multiple times a day, so the patient, the person must be able to afford it. So, it must be affordable. If you have, if actually, if you can develop a sensor that is uh, non-disposable or can be uh, for repeated use, it's actually quite good. But uh, the, the current um, blood glucose in the market are uh, disposable uh, sensors. So here is your glucose uh, testing strip. So this is the test strip. This is the disposable test strip. So this one is the 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 read it, the, the the equipment that they are used to read the test strip. So you will put the blood in here. So this is the test strip. You will put it in the device. So this is the electrical contact with the device. But the blood is here. So technically, if it's attached here, the blood will be around here. So you have uh, your blood sample and it will uh, flow so you have here your working electrode in this uh, region and you have your uh because this is uh, uh it's electrochemical still so you have your uh, electrodes here so you have the, the silver silver chloride reference electrode for measuring the electrical signal produced so this is your blood glucose strip so this is the schematic of this one so it's actually quite small it's very thin and uh, the next uh, sensor that we have in this lecture is displacement and pressure sensors. So there are several types of uh, displacement or pressure sensors. So they can be uh, piezoresistive, piezoelectric, capacitive, or inductive. So almost all of these uh, pressure sensors are produced using MEMS technology, and they contain integrated bridge measurement circuits. So why do we need or why do we have to do displacement or pressure sensors? So uh, because we need to look at uh, movements, uh, pressure pressure changes or displacements in some areas of our body. For example, here, intracranial pre pressure in the brain as an indication for diagnosis and monitoring of hydrocephalus. In the eyes, uh, the intraocular pressure, actually it was in the, in the, uh, the video uh, in the in the first video of this lecture part, where you will ha you have a contact lens with a MEMS device, so it's used to uh, monitor glaucoma, uh, diagnose and monitor glaucoma, and then in the heart, of course, uh, pressure sensors uh, to detect the blood pressure level so usually as a detector for hypertension and then in the lungs so possible pulmonary embolisms in the lung uh, in these um, pulmonary arteries. In the stomach, you have the uh, possible uh, medical case is diverticulitis. They are used to measure intraluminal pressure. So uh, when we say luminal, it's inside the lumen of the uh, of your uh, your stomach, your the inside lining you have the lumen. So the pressure inside the the lumen, and then you have intradiscal pressure. So the the discal pressure here here is actually the spine part, especially the the lower spine area. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So when you say intradiscal pressure, these are the because the, the spines, your backbones, are actually um, they are joints. So it, between the two backbones, you have your uh, cartilage disc. So the pressure uh, exerted on those discs. So this is the intradiscal pressure. So that's um, a, a measurement. Uh, we need um, pressure measurement, of course, to ma monitor some disc degeneration. Usually seen, it can be seen for especially arthritis. Um, patients or even the disc the, the disc gen the generation um, condition where of course the disc between the bones in your spine becomes uh, generated or uh, they are uh, being destroyed and um, and then for the bladder you have the urethral pressure if you have um, this is prostatitis so basically uh, inflammations if you are prostate so uh, urethral pressure measurements so these are some areas of the body where we require measurement of pressures and even displacements. So for a piezoelectric sensor, actually here is your schematic. So the pressure sensing element combines resistors and an etched diaphragm structure to produce a structure with a pressure dependent resistance. So this is one type of a pressure sensing device using a piezoresistive one. So when incorporated on a bridge circuit, so here is actually a, a, sim, a bridge circuit similar one. So uh, this change in resistance can be transduced into a change in the output voltage of your seal. So it, uh, of course, as a piezo resistors, you have your uh, change, change in the shape, and of course, it 
generates your uh, change in the uh, output voltage. So miniature strain gauges produced using the MEMS technology can also be implanted. Actually, MEMS technology is very um, uh, widely used here for um, for measurement of pressures and sensor because not only are um, the movements or the pressure are small, sometimes the, the area, the region, also are small. For example, uh, the intra uh, intravenial or intra arterial pressures. So they are very very small. So uh, MEMS is actually very um, useful here. So uh, movement close to the bone implants to monitor small cracks in the bone. So in the example in the uh, this degeneration, so intracranial or sorry intra disc pressures. So uh, of course small cracks. Uh, some of the when we talk about small cracks in the bone, they can be hair, uh, hairline fracture are considered quite large cracks. So they can be uh, microscopic cracks. So here is an example of your pressure uh, piezo resistive sensors. So this is, a, this is your cross section of your silicon based N well uh, piezo resistor, and this is your. Um, the uh, a bridge type of resistor piezo resistor so displacement so if you have a pressure detection here so there's a displacement and of course the deformation of this uh, diaph diaphragm uh, produces your signal so uh, the, an example of application for the uh, piezo resistant resistance sensor is the venous occlusion platys Mography. So this is a simple technique that is used to assess the general vascular function of your patient. So when you talk about a uh, general vascular function, for a vascular function, it's about uh, our blood vessels, usually blood vessels. So it can also be used to measure the effects of systematically administered drugs such as vas vasodilators. So sometimes, uh, especially for people uh, suffering for, say, hypertension or atherosclerosis, so because of some blockages in their arteries and veins, or uh, their there must be some, uh, they require vasodilator drugs. So when you talk about vasodilators, they are drugs that increases the cross-sectional area of your um, blood vessel. So instead of restricting the, the if, if, you, if you imagine your blood vessel as a host, so uh, some patients, because of occlusions or pinching of this host, your blood vessels, of course, the blood cannot flow properly. So some administered drugs, so they they in, they they relaxes the mesh the 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 uh, the muscle cells in the uh, arterial and venous um, the blood vessels, so that uh, it it basically dilates, so it increases or um, it. It, I can't. I won't say it stretches, but it increases uh, area, so it won't. Uh, the flow won't be restricted. So, to to measure uh, drugs that can actually do that. So, uh, usually this is uh, from a clinical test or even in vitro preclinical testings. So, of course, uh, can this drug act as a vasodilator? So they need a way to measure the dilation of the blood pressure. So here uh, you will. Here comes, of course, the application of your uh, peso resistive device. So you have these VOPs. So in a similar manner, some peso resistive strain gauges are also used in cardiovascular and respiratory measurements. So especially uh, in the in the uh, passage of uh, the air passages in our uh, bronchial tubes. So they they want especially when you have asthma. So it's either um, inflammation that causes restriction in the uh, bronchial uh, tubes in our um, in the pa air passages in our lungs so they need to have um, a way to actually measure for some measurements of your um, the air passages there so uh, similarly so again they are using cardiovascular and respiratory measurement of the volume and dimension of tissues such as vessel diameter by placing the strain gauge around a particular vessel so here is an example of your platysmograph. So usually it's actually uh, just a simple uh, rubber, uh, I won't say rubber band, but uh, something similar in um, uh, similar to a rubber band that play, that is placed around your uh, vein. So you, it's measuring here the dilation of the veins in your calf. So this is your wire-based strain gauge. So the blood flow can be estimated from a linear uh, a linear portion of the plot. So here, uh, you, well, it's not technically linear, but you know, in uh, in an analytical chemistry or actually in an analysis, so we are looking for a linear, 
relatively linear area in this graph. So this is around this area can be considered linear. So the, the why do you want a linear area? Because it shows us a direct proportion with time versus cuff. So remember from algebra, we always are involved with a linear equation. And the application of that is here. So measurements of your, um, um, basically, uh, linear equations are the best way to accurately measure or the easiest, least, least uh, complicated way for measuring the um, the change of, uh, of course, here, calf volume versus time. So this is uh, one of the way for measurement of your um basically the, the the flow of the blood using your piezo resistant uh, sensor so here is another example of a piezo resistive sensor so this is for a disposable blood pressure sensor so these they are placed in line with intravenous bags so if you um if you look at um uh, heaven forbid uh for people that are uh confined in the hospital and they need to have um IV drips. So the there these uh, some these are sensors that are that allows the administration of certain uh, drips on a timely manner in time with uh, with of course the blood flow or sometimes on a certain particular time it automatically administers the the fluid on certain times. So here is um, in line with intravenous saline bag. So this prevents your Clotting. So the silicon chip here uh, has an integrated with stone bridge configuration with a protective gel covering. So this is your gel and uh, the electrical connection. So in case e, uh, this is for uh, some patients that need to have cardiac defib defibrillation. So this is another example of a piezo resistive device. So you have your disposable blood pressure sensor device. So for the other type of sensor, uh, we also have piezoelectric sensor. So piezoelectric materials, uh, when we talk about piezoelectric, they are materials that have the property th uh, that generates a voltage when a mechanical force is applied to one phase of the material with the voltage being directly proportional to the applied force. So that's how we actually can measure uh, the uh, pressure or basically displacement or uh, disfiguration of your device basically the the amount of force so unlike the piezo resistive strain gauge sensors the piezoelectric sensors require no external voltage to produce your signal piezoelectric sensors typically have very high output impedance and produce small voltage so since that is uh, one of the setbacks here they therefore require the use of specialized equipment such as low loss coaxial cables and low noise amplifiers in the measurement chain so here's an example of a piezoelectric transducer used in automatic blood pressure measurement. So this is your piezoelectric sensor. This is usually placed in the wrist, in your pulse, in the wrist. So here's your uh, radial artery. So this is in your, of course, this is the bone. Okay, so it measures the pulse using, um, of course, uh, pressure, uh, in the pressure exerted by the, the pulse. Of course, after every heartbeat, of course, this is the blood pressure, so you have the pulse. So the amount of pressure uh, is relayed to your sensor, and you will get your uh, blood pressure. So here's another look at this uh, piezoelectric sensor. Piezoelectric pre pre pressure transducer. These are small, this is small version of a device. So a uh, flexible one that can be uh, stick on or attached to your wrist. So that's it for our lecture on different sensors in biomedical equipment.